Thank you, gentlemen, for that message in song. And good morning, and friends. Welcome to Mount Gravet Seventh-day Adventist Church of Worship Hour. And uh, I might just tell you next year, if you are visitors, please come again next Sabbath. The preacher will be Pastor Zenny, our resident senior pastor. Before we start, shall we have a word of prayer? Loving for Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to come to worship you this morning. We pray your spirit will guide us as we study your word. May we see Jesus in our worship. In his precious name, amen. The 16th century Protestant reformer in Scotland by the name of John Knox. He was uh, well known for his Reformation work and more so for his fiery sermons. As John Knox lying in, dying in bed, he whispered to his wife, he said, please dear, go and find where I first cast my anchor, where I first cast my anchor. Without hesitation, she turned to John Gospel according to John chapter 17. The famous Christ high priestly prayer. And uh, the chapter has been called by many Bible scholars as the noblest and purest pearl of devotion. Before we begin to study the lessons from this incomparable prayer of Jesus, we need to wind back the clock a few hours in order to set the scene that leads to this prayer. When Jesus celebrated his last Passover service with his disciples in the upper room, he did so with a heavy heart because he knew his public ministry was over. In a little while, he will be arrested tried for political treason, publicly humiliated, and crucified as a criminal. If there ever was a time Jesus need comfort and support from his disciples, it was on the night of his arrest but Jesus received no comfort, no consolation, no words of encouragement from his closest friends. The disciples arrived in the upper room filled with pride and preoccupied with self-importance and serving ambitions as well as hostile rivalry. You can imagine the room was filled with tension. Any one of them would gladly step over the others in order to get the choice assignment in the kingdom of power. They were too self-absorbed driven by a lust for power. They were insensitive to Christ's 
heavy heart. Feelings of jealousy, resentment, impair their thinking and understanding. All they could think about was to get that best position thereafter. No one, none, none, none of the disciples was thinking about taking the role of a servant because customary they wash, someone wash their feet. And that it was unthinkable for them to want to take that role. As far as they're concerned, it was a servant's role. Imagine the shock the disciples felt as they see and saw the master picking up the jug and the basin and the towel, starting with Judas and wash their feet. That evening, Jesus revealed the secret of his spiritual power and it was the, his constant dependence on his father. He also revealed to the disciples what could, what could they secret spiritual power is to depend, connect every day with God. As his parable, the vine and the branch demonstrated. He also revealed the disciples' greatest need, brotherly love and humility and unity. He further revealed the imminent arrival of his successor, the Holy Spirit. And finally, through a variety of magnificent promises. He revealed his deep and unchanging love for his immediate and future followers. At this farewell gathering between Jesus and his disciples draws to a close with an intercessory prayer. Now we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let us take a closer look on chapter 17. Could you please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 17. This is Jesus' prayer, unforgettable prayer. The chapter can be easily grouped into three sections. The first section covers the first five verses. As Jesus prays for himself, that he might be glorified. The second section covers verses 6 to 19. And Jesus prays for his disciples that they might be sanctified. And the last section covers the remainder of the chapter, verses 20 to 26. Jesus prays for his future followers that they might be unified. Perhaps we deal with the first section first. In here, 
amongst five verses, at least three things are worthy of note. Number one, consider Jesus' request that he might be glorified. For himself, he made two petitions. Firstly, that he will be able to bear the agony of the cross so that the Father's love and his justification and his justice will be for this uh, rebellious planet may be vindicated. Secondly, that through him eternal life will be available to all who come to him. Jesus spoke of the cross as his glory and his glorification. His finest hour was the hour of his crucifixion. By his death on the cross, he drew all men and women to him in a way that he wasn't able to do in his life on earth. The cross was the glory of Jesus because it meant the completion of the work God the Father gave him to do. By the cross, Jesus made us certain of God's love. Ellen White, in one of her books, Desire of Ages, Page 758, I quote, Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work he came to do. And with his parting breath, he shouted, It is finished. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his victory banner on the eternal heights. There was joy among the angels. All heaven triumphed in the Saviour's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost." Unquote. There was an old painting in a museum in Europe depicting a scene from World War I, showing an army engineer repairing a field telephone line that was damaged during the fighting. He had just completed, put the lines together in time for an important message to come through when he was shot by the enemy. The picture shows, shows him in the moment of death and beneath it in the caption with two words, message through. The, engi the engineer had given his life so that the message might get through. Friends, there was only one sure way that God could communicate his love to sinful human beings, and that was through the death of his son on the cross. By his death, Christ re-established the line of communication between God and us. The second point worthy of notice that in these verses, verse one to five, it is in this part of Christ's prayer we find the great definition of eternal life. It's verse 3. 
which is to know God, reflects again on the absolute necessity of a personal and vital personal relationship with God if we wish to have eternal life. And finally, please notice that Jesus claimed his pre-existence with his heavenly Father on verse 5. Now, now, Father, oh, sorry. Yes. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now let's read on from verse 6 to 19, the prayer for his disciples, that they may be sanctified. On the hours before the cross, Jesus bared his soul to his disciples. In the upper room, and later as they walked towards the Garden of Gethsemane, the things he said and did revealed once again how deeply he cared for his own. By a silent act of humble service, he destroyed their pride and jealousy. Through an abundance of promises, he opened heaven's storehouse. And in his moving prayer, he figuratively swept up in his arms his followers of all ages, including you and me, and committed us to his heavenly Father's love and care. So even in his prayer for himself, Jesus' ultimate goal is to glorify his Father and benefit others. Jesus then focused his prayer directly on behalf of his disciples because they will soon have to learn how to live without his physical presence among them. He does not pray for the world, but only for those who have renounced the world. I pray for them, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. He prayed for his disciples because they will have to remain in the world without him, and they will become the object of the world's evil attention. Have you noticed a remarkable thing in Jesus' prayer? With all his power, what that he displayed during his ministry on earth, he still see great value in praying for others. It tells us that prayer for others accomplishes things in this world that never would happen otherwise. Now in the last part of Jesus' prayer, he turns to the future generation. Generations of Christians. In the fullest sense, these generations include all Christians who have never had an encounter with Jesus in the flesh. Now let's go to verses 20 to 26 and see Jesus prays for future believers that they might be unified. Friends, we cannot study this section of Christ's prayer without being deeply touched that Jesus remembered and prayed for us. Each one of us is included specifically in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message.
What does Jesus pray for us as, as he prays? Firstly, Jesus asks that we all may be one. Secondly, that we may be with him where he is. And why does Jesus pray for our unity? Because he wants the world to recognize that the Father has sent him into the world and indicates that the best way to convince the world of the fact that he has been here is for the world to see us united by love. The world will recognize that his being here has made a dramatic difference for us and in us. When the love that Jesus prays for produces unity in the church, the world will come to know that Jesus is truly the one who represents the, the character of the Father on earth. On the other hand, the world never will be seriously attracted to Christ through a church that is bitterly divided. When Christ's prayer for us is answered fully, as it must certainly will be answered fully, the resulting unity based on love will draw multitudes of people to our church doors seeking to join us. Ellen Y. in another book she wrote on education, page 258. I quote, we may ask for any gift he has promised, for the pardon of sin, for the Holy Spirit, for a Christ-like temper, for wisdom and strength to do his work, then we are to believe that we will receive and return thanks to God that we have received it, unquote. We are invited to take our stress and sorrows, our pressures and problems, our doubts and discouragements to Jesus in exchange for his peace. The Bible tells us no storm that rages against us, within us, or has peace. No storm is too great to be calmed by the promise of the Prince of Peace. Jesus prays for the sanctification of all believers through the word of God. He foresees a succession of believers will not know him in the physical sense. He prays for their unity that comes from their love for him and for the Father. So essential is Christian unity that Christ links it to the purpose of his coming to this earth and dying on the cross. Verse, verse 23. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Thank you. Even though only a few hours lay between him and the agony of the cross, Jesus' major concern was to build within his disciples the desire and the ability to follow his example. For effective Christian service, they would need humility, hope, and unity and to keep connected with God in prayer. They will need great endurance
for the trials ahead. But that strength must be motivated by a willingness to serve others, to take the last place in line, and to be unconcerned about rank or prestige. They will need the inner resource of hope, which must accurately reflect God's word and his will. The master in his final talk with his disciples taught them three vital lessons and to us as well. Each of these lessons may be summarized in a formula P plus C equals H. It's part of the um, formula you can see. Well, and um, the first one is promise plus Christ equal hope. Those comforting promises undergirded by the faithfulness of Christ offers reassuring hope to all Christians. Thank you. This, and the second one, it might be in a different sequence, I'm sorry. Um, P, prayer plus Christ equals harmony. The incomparable prayer for unity articulated by Christ, the Son of God, means that one day there shall be peaceful harmony among his followers. And the last one, Passover plus Christ that Passover su su uh, supper, enhanced by the action of Christ, brought a lesson of divine humility. William Barclay, in his book, one of his books, recorded uh, that there is a legend about St. Francis Assisi who in his early days, before he became a monk, he was very rich. Nothing but the best was good enough for him, but he was unhappy, and there's no peace in his soul. One day, as he was riding along outside the city, when he saw a leper with masses of sores, Truly a horrible sight. Ordinarily, the fastidious Francis would have recoiled and run away. Something happened to him inside of him. He got off the horse, he flung his arms around the leper. As he embraced the leper, the figure turned into Jesus. So, it is said that the nearer we are to suffering, the nearer we are to God. Have you ever watched someone who care for a loved one and who is sick or disabled? The person will stoop to do the most manual and repulsive chores. Yet, in situations where love is not the motivating factor, we may feel contempt for doing such humble acts. What lessons of humility and love did Jesus teach his disciples when he stooped to wash the dusty feet of his followers. Can I suggest that our love and empathy for others is a good indicator of our love for God? As Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 40, inasmuch as you have done, done it to one of these, least of these, 
of my brothers, sisters, you have done it to me. In conclusion, as Christians on this earth, it seems that we are never really fit in. We always seem to be out of place. This world does not need us or want us. It has no place for us. But wait, friends. Our Father in heaven has many mansions where we fit right in and where we know we belong. We can count on that because Jesus promised it. We have waited a long time to go home and Jesus has waited a long time to come to get us. But don't be impatient and don't be discouraged. Jesus promises, I will come again. We can count on that because Jesus promised it. The cross was not the end. There was the resurrection to follow. When we get to heaven, we will not be concerned about whether the streets are paved with gold or with asphalt. As long as we can walk on them together with Jesus, we will not care if the 12 gates are made of large pearls or wrought iron. As long as we can get through one of them to be with Jesus. Heaven is not just a place. You see, it also is a person with a capital P. And someday, Jesus will come again to take us to be with him. Jesus promised it.